Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the, sec for the third artist conversation that we're organizing to complement the exhibition of the recipients of the 2020 Governor General's Awards in Visual and Media Arts, currently installed at the Art Gallery of Alberta. My name is Catherine Croston, and I'm the Executive Director and Chief Curator of the AGA. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are hosting the exhibition and this webinar from Treaty 6 territory, the traditional land of diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Nihoawak, Cree, Anishinaabe, Soto, Nisitapi, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, Dene, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge the many Indigenous, First Nations, and Inuit people who make Alberta their home today. This acknowledgement is just one very small step on the path towards reconciliation, and there is critical work that we must continue to do to address the ongoing impacts of colonization. The Governor General's Award in Visual and Media Arts is a lifetime achievement award that recognizes an artist's career, body of work, and contribution to the visual and media arts and fine craft in Canada. This year, eight artists are being honored in recognition of their exceptional careers and remarkable contributions to the visual arts, media arts, and fine craft. The 2020 winners are Deanna Bowen, Dana Claxton, Ruth Cuthand, Michael Fernandez, Jorge Lozano Lorsa, Ken Lam, Anna Torma, and Zainab Vergi. This evening, we are very pleased to welcome Dana Claxton. Dana Claxton is a critically acclaimed artist who works in film, video, photography, single and multi-channel video installations, and performance art. Born in Yorkton, Yorktown, Saskatchewan, of Hunk Papa Lakota heritage, Dana grew up in Moose Jaw. Her practice investigates beauty, the body, the socio-political, and the spiritual, combining her multi-layered worldview with Indigenous issues, both past and present. Her work has been shown internationally at institutions such as the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney, Australia, and is held in public and private and corporate collections across Canada, including the Vancouver Art Gallery, the Art Gallery of Alberta, and the National Gallery of Canada. Dana has received numerous awards in her career, including Best Experimental Film at the Imaginative Film Festival, the Natitian Award for Outstanding Achievement, and most recently, the 2020 Scotiabank Photography Award. Dana is head of and associate professor in the Department of Visual Art, Art History and Theory at the University of British Columbia, where she teaches theory about love, performance art, and studio practice. She lives in Vancouver on unceded Salish territory. Tonight, Dana is in conversation with Pauline Petit, a fellow artist, former student, and Dana's studio manager. Pauline is a Vancouver-based artist and owner of Studio 26 Artist Services, a business that caters to the needs of the contemporary artistic practices. Pauline was born and raised in France and moved to Canada in 2007. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Visual Arts from the University of British Columbia in 2013. Her work focuses on the mediation of language, spoken and visual. She concerns herself with the historical, cultural and often unacknowledged narratives inherent to language. Through her business, Pauline has the privilege of working and consulting with award-winning artists such as Dana Claxton, Christos Dikiakos, Barry Jones and Terry Lynn Williams Davidson. In 2017, she was one of the winners of the Magenta Foundation Flash Forward competition. Pauline would like to acknowledge that she lives and works on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, Suwamish, Stolo, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. Before I turn things over to Dana and Pauline, just a few notes. Uh, Dana and Pauline will be talking for about 45 minutes, following which we will answer questions. Please answer your questions using the chat function. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank EPCOR, who support AGA online programming through their Heart and Soul Fund. Please join me now in welcoming Dana Claxton and Pauline Petit. Hello. Oh, I think you're on mute. Goodness. There we I'm go. Sorry. Thank you. Of course. Um, of course, of course, Pauline to the rescue, right? Thank you, everyone. And thank you, uh, Catherine, for that lovely introduction. Um, I've had a few technical difficulties. So now I'm, uh, I'm using my cell phone. So I'll try not to be uh, too, um, in, in, in too much movement here. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I guess I just will give a bit of context is that I thought it would be so great to have a conversation and acknowledge that I the work that I do with Pauline Petit 
and that um of course artists are never working you know solo and the more and more i uh, create work the more you know the, the bigger and bigger sort of my circle of uh, of people who i work with become and certainly in the last 10 years um it's been uh I suppose imperative and uh, foundational that I have a studio assistant, and then actually, uh, as uh, late uh, as of late, uh, Pauline's been promoted to studio manager. So I'm excited about that and helping me with some sort of the some of the you know and you know the business aspects of of art and the demands that are put on an artist. Um, so I also wanted to think about sort of the sort of some of the foundational um, teachings and influences of my own practice. And of course, it starts with Spirit Song and Spirit Song was the Native Indian theater group in Vancouver. And I attended it in the early 80s uh, to the mid 80s. And it was like this, as I always would call this clearinghouse for, for urban Indians and anybody who had an inclination of creativity. And so you could go and you could study traditional theater practices or storytelling or arts administration. So I studied a bit of everything and you would get certificates. And um, I wrote some of my first uh plays there that I later developed into films, one being the red paper. And, um, you know, also first and foremost, I'm actually a poet is, is my first artistic practice has been as a poet. And then as a photographer, I've had a camera since I was about 16, my first Canon AE one. So, um, you know, over the years, I've, I've sort of melded these things, these things, but spirit song was so instrumental in sort of providing me a space where what was you know sort of my inner world of creativity could could come about but then also the administrative tasks that you know that were that that I had to do and that they also put me through training of course have contributed so much to my filmmaking to budgets and those kind of things, and then also ultimately to the administrative work that I'm doing at UBC. And at UBC is where I met Pauline, so I wanted to uh, say that. And she was in one of my uh, 300 level uh, studio theory classes. And I think we might have been reading Michelle Foucault. Of course, we were reading Michelle Foucault. <laughs> And Pauline would come to class and she was so, you know, she always had something to say. I want to say she was outspoken because, you know, it was a quiet class. It was nine o'clock on Friday mornings, but she always had something to bring to class. And I remember at one point I thought, I think she's like an older person stuck in this young woman's body. Like, you know, I was just thinking, because I would always, I was thinking, who is this person? Who is this person? So we met in the classroom and then over the years we got to know each other. And then I was uh, looking for a studio assistant and one of her colleagues in the department, one of her cohorts um, uh, suggested uh that uh, said that Pauline was uh, really great and a number of skills. So that's, um, then we started to work together. Mm -hmm, that's right. It was actually right after I graduated. I think it was the same summer. Um, and I know we'll talk about it a little bit more at length, of, like when I came into your career <laughs> uh, later in the, in the talk. So, uh, so maybe we can skip that for now. Okay. I'm going to press this next button. Sounds good. Oh, text work. Yes. Yes. Go, to text. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking, I know that you were really keen on talking about your text work because for some reason, some people seem to, to not realize that it's such an integral part of your practice. Right. And so it's so important that you mentioned that, yes, one of the first things you did was being a poet along with being, um, uh, an essay, uh, an essay writer and a, and a playwright. Uh, and then when you actually look back through all your practice with that lens, it all comes into place. Like, of course, text has always been there. Absolutely. And thinking about this work, so this is called 10 Little Poems from the Pitt Gallery. Um, also a very foundational teachings for me have been within the Artist Run Center movement um, with the Pitt Gallery, Video In, the Western Front, the Grant Gallery, 
and then some other uh, spaces in Canada. But those were foundational for me to uh, be taught the role of art in society and the uh, value of artists in society and that artists can be initiators and administrators and and create their own essentially create their own opportunities um and make their own space so this was at the pit gallery and it was called little indians and so it's lovely because i couldn't find some pictures of spirit song but in the background there it's daryl gus and he i met him at spirit song mm -hmm. and so um i was this was ten little poems so i was reciting you know it was a multimedia performance with my poetry and Sam Bob was in this as well and so Sam Bob who I've had a you know 30 ish year or more working relationship with as he he is an actor currently we are writing a script together and so those days at spirit song um you know I I uh became part of a creative milieu of people who I still work with. Russell Wallace, for instance, the composer, I still work with him. We met at Spirit Song and um, Archer Pachawas and Evan Adams. I'm hoping to work with him soon one day as an actor. And so um, some of us from Spirit Song went into, you know, um, traditional kind of acting, theater and film and television and others through that creative uh, place um, uh, went into performance art. So I, this was sort of one of my, this was, this was a collapse of, um, it was interdisciplinary multimedia uh, performance, this work. Mm -hmm. I've got somebody's cutting trees outside. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so this was text for Winnipeg. And I did a residency in Winnipeg at uh, uh, Women Artists Mentoring Women Artists. And um, I wrote all, it was all poems uh, that I had written about Winnipeg. And it was such an extraordinary place, Winnipeg. It was, you know, it was, it had major energy there. And I actually have to say I had a number of, profound spiritual experiences in Winnipeg. So I wrote about the works and then uh, whatever, I think it was seven years later, was invited to Urban Shaman, another artist on center, to um, to create a work. And, and they were having this, I think it was called My Winnipeg. The whole city was doing uh, works around My Winnipeg. And so this was My Winnipeg. So it was a, a two-channel video installation with texts of My of, mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. um, I actually have a question for you on this work because that's something that came up more recently in one of your recent works as well. So the, the title for this one is Text for Winnipeg, but essentially all of the vowels are dropped, right? And uh, you use that, that style uh, with Indian iron workers where Indian is just NDN. So I was wondering if this is something that is particularly meaningful in any way. Like we never actually got to talk about this. Thanks for, for asking me that. I get, right. So Indian, Indian, um, you know, of course, which is a fraught word and a contested word and people love it or there's, there's all kinds of conversations around it. Mm -hmm. So there's the spelling of it, NDN, Indian. Mm -hmm. And because it's like the, the, when Indians say, they say it so fast, Indian. So it's NDN, NDN. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why I've used that, but text, T-X-T is just also, you know, sometimes the English language gets in the right in the way <laughs> so it's also not allowing the English language to have complete uh you know uh, say over how words should always be spelt or said or even in sentences mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and of course we should always be making up new words and it's all in capital too it's like you're not being subtle about it at all <laughs> it's just uh, taking ownership of those words again it's pretty great <laughs> and also i think sometimes capitals just look really good together mm -hmm. not necessarily that i'm shouting this no. you know, but, but that they just you know aesthetically they looked good together yeah oh, yeah there's another image of text for winnipeg i can't read that oh can i oops oh it says neil young lived there he said you're ah you're kidding i said neil young lived there i love him but i've never brought one of bought one of his records 
<laughs> sort of, you know, you would get, you know, people would point things out. So that was one thing about Neil Young. Mm -hmm. Can you read what that one says? I tried a slice of maple sugar pie in St. Boniface. Those Iroquois sure know a lot about the maple tree. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you can read them. Mm -hmm. So some more work. This is outdoor um, digital video, digital billboard work. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sort of working with images uh, from my photography, from uh, from the Mustang suite, and then adding text to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess that was in 2010, question mark? I think it was. And uh, I know we've had this discussion before where it felt like, at least for me, from coming from the outside and coming after the facts, right, how Mustang Suite was such a pivotal moment. Like you can um, identify several pivotal moments in your career, and I feel that Mustang Suite was really one of those. So it's really neat to see it being being used um, in that context with the text on top of it, because uh, it, it was just so powerful on its own, but it feels like it doesn't actually detract from that strength at all to have that text on it. Mm -hmm. And thinking about how the boring of text and we'll get to it with Gramsci, but also I should say is that, so with the Mustang suite is that, um, and, and, you know, I guess my love and devotion and commitment to artist run center culture, like I will always want to, show and artist run centers you know forever and so mm -hmm. that 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 was actually a commission from the um alternator in right. Kelowna who right, right, right. Commissioned it. and it was a big commission it was mm -hmm. a very generous commission and and for a smaller artist run center to um to invite me to to do that it was it was uh it was great <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Now we have this beautiful uh, series of work that we get to all enjoy. <laughs> and so this love me. Okay. So t t thinking about the everyday and, uh, and, and working with materials, this was one of those kooky black velvet artworks actually that Paul Wong gave me mm -hmm. of this Indian papoose. And, you know, he, he gives me kitsch stuff when he finds it mm -hmm. and, the last time he gave me some things and he said, I know you'll make art with this. So um, I was thinking about, you know, all the conversations around reconciliation were happening. Canada's in this state of reconciliation, right? As we know, also a problematic term. Some people like conciliation. Some people don't even know that Canada's in a state of reconciliation or what that might mean. Mm -hmm. And so I was going to a conference it was a symposium in Saskatchewan at the U of S, and um, and so I I made this 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 work was inspired by the idea of reconciliation, mm -hmm. and that's love me, and that you know can people uh, you know love Indigenous people is the question that's being asked here. Mm -hmm. um what I also really like about quite a few of the pieces that you made in Indian Candy, because this is part of the Indian Candy series from 2013, is that we're kind of finding that, um, uh, I don't want to say collage, but multi-layered approach to medium, right? So there's the text and there's this image and there's the appropriation, but then it's, is it actually appropriation when you're basically uh, using an image that is so fraught with history and, and that is like so, just going back to spirit song, you know, basically taking all of these things and, and creating this piece that ends up having, that it's more than just a photo, it's more than just an, uh, a borrowed image and it's more than just a text piece, right? And that's something that is quite strong in in, um, in Indian candy. Yeah, sort of the, mul the multiple layers of, mm -hmm. of meaning, the multiple layers of histories, uh, multiple entry points, Tonto, uh, I think this one says, I, I don't have a full image of it. It says, Tonto, pray for you, which I think is actually something that the character says in the in the movie, right? In the series. Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of, of course, Tonto fans out there. And um, Jay Silverfields, a Mohawk actor. Mm -hmm. And so they 
would have him in this series sort of speak broken Indian, you know, mm. Tonto. And he kind of spoke in this monotone and, you know, it was all problematic, but it was all amazing as well. People mm. loved him, you know. And so there's a number of um, sites that list all of the all of the uh, the sentences that he would say. And mm. so that, you know, if and if those sites were all true, <laughs> um, so the, I, I borrowed some of those sayings uh, from from him and put them on. You know, and he he comes from another generation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he was, you know, he wasn't. He was before uh, that TV series was before. You know, wasn't. Well, I was a child, but a little bit before before me. But people. It, what, it, what has been interesting is that when people have seen this of the generation who watched him, mm -hmm. they they melt because they loved him. People mm -hmm. loved his character. I don't know. Is it is it worth kind of bringing up what happened when this went on the billboard? Because this whole series ended up being on billboards across Canada as part of the Contact Festival, right? And Tonto Pray For You ended up in Winnipeg and there was like such a backlash, which was so interesting. And I think that you even got to do a bit of an interview about that. And I wonder if it's like, I, do you want to talk a bit about it? Because I thought that was so interesting when it happened. I will. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so it's, it was, it was, I get, it was a public art commission from works that had already been created mm -hmm. from the Indian Candy series. And there was 28 billboards, but this particular one, it was when it was in, when it was in this one was in, when it was in Saskatoon, oh, Saskatoon, sorry, became controversial. and somebody saw it. And, um, uh, one person as a, as a Christian was offended that it said, Tonto pray for you. And really? so, and, and then, and then somebody else was offended because they wanted to know if an indigenous person had created these images. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I remember I ha I just, I, and this is where I decided I'm not just going to grant anybody a television interview mm -hmm. and because, you know, you can get turned into a little soundbite and mm -hmm. taken out of context. And, um, but they, you know, they, it was national airtime that they gave just due to the topic. Mm -hmm. And, but it, yeah, that was also, it was the first time that I did such a big outdoor work yeah. and, and, and where I, I didn't feel then after that is safe mm. going outside the gallery space, mm. <laughs> safe in the gallery to some capacity. You know, I'm used to being in the gallery. I love being in the gallery. It's the home of art. I mean, art, art should have a home in all kinds of places, but the gallery is the home of art and I feel safe there. Mm -hmm. So then to, you know, go and, and have these billboards, which are really quite tame to be so controversial was the first time I was in in uh, in the situation uh, as being deemed that it was con that something I had made was controversial. Mm -hmm. Well, especially when you consider that so much of what makes this work is already existing at large, you know. So, isn't it fascinating that it's just the slight rearranging of those those images and words that again already exist at large <laughs> and that's all it took you know to create that conversation it's lively for sure but it doesn't take much to get people talking which is nice in, in many ways i would say when it comes to art anyway yeah i mean it was great that these people were looking and responding to something that they had seen sort of visual culture you know mm -hmm. uh, out in the public. So this was just an image of Indian candy with uh, Maria Tolf, Tolf Chief. Mm -hmm. Another love, love me. And this one actually um, was in multiple locations, but it was also in Winnipeg in a particular neighborhood. And some people uh, were uncertain about the meaning of it because in one of the neighborhoods, it was um, uh, there were sex workers. Mm. And so, uh, th so they did a, oh, this is, a, I don't think I got interviewed for that one, but they did a news story on it and they interviewed people who were looking at it mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was so lovely. There was a man and his children and the man said, but they, he said, but it's just asking you, do you love, her? do you love this, the person in the picture? It was lovely what he said. He didn't look at being 
that, you know, that we, we weren't putting, I didn't, this is another thing is I didn't select where these works go. You know, you yeah. you're in the, the free billboard space sometimes, right? Sort of nonprofit billboard space. Mm -hmm. And so I happened to be in an area with sex workers and people were sort of wondering that meaning within seeing love me, you know, over top of a, an indigenous uh, image. That is so successful that it ended up being there. It's almost a serendipity. Okay. Now this one I think was in Vancouver, Geronimo and Sitting Bull. So those again were mined from the internet signatures of Native Americans and just thinking of these two fellows who uh, who were, you know, uh, sort of uh, liberation, uh, really liber... They were key liberation uh, people who who did a lot for indigenous people. White Buffalo, of course, that was in Vancouver. Geronimo again, that was in Vancouver. And also color, the, working with Indian candy, of course, you know, playing with that term Indian candy, which it, for some people might not know it, but on the West Coast, it's 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 candied, mar mapleized, uh, maple syrup kind of uh, wild salmon, dried mm -hmm. wild salmon. And so I was playing with that term Indian candy. And then, and then these were initially very colorful uh, metallic prints with a, a high gloss laminate on them. So they, oh, yeah. they were these. In, in the gallery, you feel like you could, you felt you could go and lick them. It was just crazy. I actually got to see them when they first came out. So, <laughs> Especially on the white wall, right? It's just pops so much. Yeah. And there's another one in Vancouver, mm -hmm. so lovely. And then just some more text-based work, uh, Dirt Worshipper. Um, uh, that was from a residency initially that I had done in Con at Concordia with the uh, communications department there and um, watched that terrible series that was so amazing. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of it, that Western series. Oh, um, Westwood? No, it was, it's slipping my mind. It'll come back to me. Okay. It was a, it, it was a period piece of uh, cowboys and one or two Indians. There was not very many Indians in it physically that you could see them, mm -hmm. but they would use the term to call Native Americans dirt worshipers. And I just loved that term. So then, as you know, made some works of uh, different sayings. And then this one, keep your nose close to the buffalo grass. A Lakota elder told me this and she, an elder had told her uh, when she, she, she told me this when she was about 83. And a Lakota elder had told her this when she was about 18. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just loved that, uh, that teaching, basically. Mm -hmm. And so we painted the walls turquoise. And um, I can't remember where this one was now. So this was all in Santa Fe. And the, the, the show was called You Are an Indian Land. And yeah, it was a commission, I think. Mm-hmm. And then it was lovely when we were picking out that uh, font. Yes. Yeah, we, we tried different things for sure. This is like some of my, like personally, as somebody who helps with the production, right, or the pre-production, these are my most favorite assignments, just having to get to play with all the fonts. <laughs> Oops. And uh, I might have to plug in my phone here. Yeah, this is... um more recent works as well you've been like very interested in Gramsci recently and um what's so interesting with the way that you actually put those things together it was like even putting the work together was a performative act that we only get to see the trace of now um so you had all um these quotes uh printed onto cards i actually have the cards if I can grab some at some point to show them if there's time, but, uh, and then you threw them essentially. And so that was like a very like performative gesture because then they were all on the ground and then uh, you randomly picked two at a time to make those collages of Gramsci uh, sayings almost. Yes. And the, this one is, what does that say? Luxury, Luxury Mammoth. Six Train Gorilla. 
so just so, so terms that he would use thinking about what a luxury mammal is in terms of privilege and class mm-hmm. and uh, but then also the thinking gorilla of the proletariat on the assembly line mm-hmm. and so and they were you know cha- there were you know chapters and chapters apart in the in the notebooks but just mm-hmm. the idea of those two ideas of the sort of you know the gentry privileged woman you know, being with a thinking gorilla, I just thought it was so great. And that's, you know, sort of thinking about a personal ad, but mm-hmm. then also switching up materials, as you know, when we were thinking about, you know, not always privileging the sort of rectangle surface of photography. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is when I started looking at printing on uh, linens and silk. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that was like right after you had... Um actually done the wind box buffalo woman one and two right yeah yeah definitely getting into that uh different support and material at the time and just you know thinking about yeah just not always printing on paper and Mm -hmm. bringing photography into more of a sculptural form Mm -hmm. and so these are banners from uh inspired by gramsci as well and um, these are the the mysteriously missing banners, aren't they? Are they still missing? <laughs> well, I know that you want those works to be at large in the world and you actually want them disseminated. So in a way that is, I think it is perfect for them to be missing. <laughs> and oh, oh no, it's you're all perfect. You broke no. out completely. Can you can you hear me? Yes, yes. Now I can hear you. Okay, sorry. It's I also have somebody cutting down trees in the yard. Thinking about it's perfect that they're that they're in Italy and mm-hmm. um, yes, yes, that's right. Where was this? Now I forgot. I'm this is the to... Museum of uh, Modern Art in Bologna. Bologna. In Bologna. Lovely that he, uh, you know, just you know, close to uh, where Gramsci was from. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm gonna on here let the poem limp so i mm-hmm. loved this and that the idea that you know i mean in terms of perfection and uh you know allowing things to be or allowing things to you know to be imperfect mm-hmm. and he said let the poem limp i mean there was a number of times reading antonio gramsci where it would just i would just melt with some of his ideas mm-hmm. you know okay i'll go on to the next one here and there they are, the oh. bag. So that we've had these in various iterations of these banners. I've performed them. They've been in, in galleries, and uh, they'll continue to circulate. And so this is it um, uh, at uh, the urban screen at Emily Carr. So that's when you did the the more, you know, more bigger version of all of those sayings with many more quotes. I think there was like a thousand cards that you printed or something like that. And then you got to pick many combinations out of, and they were all random. So it was so wonderful printing them up and then just throwing them all up in the air. Mm-hmm. And I remember we'd grab, and I'd grab one and grab another one and I'd read them out loud. And we were like, Oh my God. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. <laughs> Put two random thoughts together. And it always worked. It was amazing. <laughs> and with profound ideas. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, just about every word, you know, that, you know, this man was thinking. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so that was fun to uh, to do those. And thinking about chance, you know, chance narrative and and seeing what would come together. I can't read that, can you? The proletariat, the peasants, and the new bourgeoisie intellectualized form. Hmm. Oh! (laughs) Well, this is really a homage to a few people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, uh, um, but just again, working with color, Indian candy really allowed me a space to work with color and uh and then text and <laughs> thinking about tupac as well as um you know incarcerated indigenous people mm-hmm. and so that's what this work was inspired by mm-hmm. 
expensive. I'll print, press next. There we go. Yeah. So that was, um, I think, what you alluded to earlier, red paper, which, so, you know, I keep mentioning pivotal moments in your career, but that was really one of them where you moved from um, the uh, performative stage and, and spirit song and really moved into the gallery uh, using the same teachings, essentially, but totally just recontextualizing the work in the gallery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, I think that was that at topographies at the VAG? It could be. I cannot remember off the top of I my head, to be honest. See, I, I can't quite see the whole slide. But that was the first time that the red paper was shown was um, at topographies at the VAG and where mm -hmm. I actually had um you know made it as an installation so it was my first installation to take then my filmmaking into the gallery space and this has always been a film for the gallery space as opposed to screening in a theater mm -hmm. and yeah that was topographies that uh uh monica gangyong and grant arnold and doreen jensen together mm -hmm. And um, so again, working with somebody who I had worked with at Spirit Song and from a play that I had written the red paper and then turning it into a, uh, to a uh, film script. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's the, uh, the installation and uh, aspect of it as well with like all those chairs, like the red chairs and they're all very, you know, um, uh, early 20th century uh, going to the cinema chairs. <laughs> that was pretty great. And then I said, yeah, and I painted them gold. And this is a production shot of, of mm -hmm. uh, Samaya, who is a woman also who I've worked with for 30 years. And I'll continue to work with her both as a, uh, her as an actress, as well as somebody who I photograph. Mm -hmm. Oops. And that's just another sort of production still from the red paper. Mm -hmm. And then Buffalo Bone China. Mm -hmm. So another one of those sort of a uh, uh, multimedia moment where you moved it into the gallery. And that was actually, uh, again, remnants of one of your performances uh, where there was first the performance where you brought out Buffalo Bone China. So uh, uh, China, porcelain is made out of all the buffaloes, uh, essentially, uh, the buffalo bones, and then you broke it. Uh, and then those remnants are here. I mean, is it, is, these are the same, right? These are the same pieces that you broke in that 97 performance. Yeah, right. And then you had like this uh, beautiful uh, collage, of, like I keep saying collage, I'm sorry, montage of, of the buffalo herds, uh, uh, I guess in the prairies in Canada or are these from uh, uh, in, in the US? They're from different sources. Different sources, okay. They're just, it all seems like they're all the same, you know, that you. Actually, you went out there and did it yourself. And again, sort of uh, uh, found found mm -hmm. some of the found and appropriated footage of Buffalo. Mm -hmm. and, um, but also, as you mentioned, a uh, doing the performance of smashing the the fine bone china. It was it was probably goat or cow bone. Mm -hmm. It wasn't buffalo, it wasn't buffalo okay. bone at this point in history. But in the day, they did use you know, when, with the extermination of the buffalo, used buffalo. So, but this would have been goat or, or cow. Mm -hmm. And, but taking those performance actions and then uh, making the performance installation and, and the video. So it was also uh, a foundational work of uh, bringing those elements into the gallery space too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, are you still here? Okay, you are. Oh, and some more performance works. Just wanted to look at that dirt worshiper. Yes, yeah, so that's before. And then there's the after picture. There it is. <sighs> Gotta love that fringe. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we have to get into the fringe. We absolutely have to get into the fringe. Like, basically, I think what you're trying to... to um, the story you're trying to, to say here is like, there's so many things that weave throughout all of your work that just keep coming back. Like, you know, uh, that just 
all throughout. And so the fringe, it's amazing. So this one, you you so you had Dirt Worshipper, which again was already kind of uh, a, another iteration of the work that you did in Santa Fe, and you hung it in the in the gallery, and it was this very rhythmic uh, shredding of that word almost, and you just. Yeah, it went like it's very rhythmic. It was almost like a song, you know, almost like the rattle song from from your piece Rattle. Uh, and you end up with this gorgeous fringe, this colorful. Oh, I just don't know. I just can't say anything anymore. It's just beautiful. <laughs> I really liked it. <laughs> And thinking of the this when I was ripping, I was you know sort of wanting to emulate the heartbeat of Mother Earth. That, was that too, yes. So there it is. That, with the... Where is that? I can't quite see. This oh, isn't the bag. It's at the bag, and so there's a video on the. Yeah, this is a still from uh, from the performance that we recorded. And so there's the the Gramsci uh, banners in action mm -hmm. at, at a at a book launch uh, for uh, Jalay Mansour. Mm -hmm. There's the smashing, the yeah, low bones of the fine bone china, rather. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm gonna. I just I'm gonna keep pressing next. Yeah. So basically. Um, I think the way that we were talking about these two sections, performances and fireboxes, is to kind of show that there's some pillars almost in your practice that like directly stemmed from spirit song and so how it sort of manifested itself uh, in different ways later on in your career. So now we're into the firebox where uh, in order to create these works, it's these massive productions where you have to be on set and there's props and there's costumes and there's uh, actors and there's uh, uh, all these things that you basically learned and took from your time making uh, movies and films uh, and being, again, at Spirit Song, but also uh, when you were creating those um, TV series at, with APTN, I believe, right? And so now it's manifesting itself into these like big, big tableau-like productions uh, of, creating those fireboxes. And I think that's when I came actually, when you made your first firebox, that's when we met and we started working together. And I think that's actually the first picture I worked on with you. It is. Yeah. And also just thinking about how, you know, the amount of uh, uh, support <laughs> that yes. it takes fireboxes, so not only from the mining of the aluminum to make the box itself mm -hmm. or the LED lights and uh, but also, you know, just the, you know, being on set and and the studio and it just the, yeah, it, it I, I don't work uh, other than, of course, the Paris series where I just go around, you know, mm -hmm. went walk uh, taking photographs, but where this particular, these particular works, uh, you know, take a great deal of uh, collaboration from many people. Mm -hmm. Well, and you kind of uh, mentioned it both when uh, they, I, I like to say premiered, uh, when they premiered at the Odane SFU and at the VAG, you said, you know, I started counting how many hands uh, touched these works, right, to make them happen. And I stopped counting after 100, right? <laughs> it was just so many people came into it. Yeah, because then also just even the the fellows at ABC, mm -hmm. you know, to, to make the the Duratran and you know the kind of labor that goes into that and yeah, so it, the, the the kind of labor that goes into making uh, fireboxes or even films as we know, but just mm -hmm. it takes a, takes a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so just looking at her image here, of course, the continued fringe and her elk robe. <laughs> Yeah, and so of course everybody, I'm sure everybody here has seen your latest work, but this was the original headdress. Yes, yeah, nice to see her. Mm -hmm. And I should say this, so this, that's Samaya Jardet again, who I've photographed for over 30 years and I mm -hmm. will photograph her more. Yeah, here's Cowboy. So that was, um, I think you made it in time for the Vancouver Art Gallery show. Um, 
And I think re-looking at it, and I mentioned this before as well, I kept thinking about how one of your hallmark, you know, like the signature style almost of, of your work, um, photo photographic work, when there, whenever there's an indigenous body, it is in an empty space. And I asked you point blank, I'm like, is there a meaning behind it? Because I have an idea, but it might be totally different than what your idea is. And so we talked a little bit about this. And I'm going to let you sort of say where they are, because I don't want to steal your thunder. Steal my thunder. <laughs> no. Well, you said, you said, come on, you have to say it. Okay. Well, I think I said, I mean, I can't completely paraphrase myself. I'm paraphrasing <laughs> myself. But I think I was saying that I'm thinking about infinity. Yes. And and, you know, the, the vastness of uh, the prairie, the plains landscape where I grew up, like even though I've been in Vancouver for 35 years, you know, my home place is still mm -hmm. uh, Saskatchewan and mm -hmm. it's still the plains and whether that's in Saskatchewan or or South and North Dakota. But, yeah. um, you know, so when you when your images of life or you know, as far as you can see, you know, you're that the, you, you can you can see, you know, thinking of the uh, the enormous sky and then all of our Lakota sky teachings. But just just that impact of uh, being able to see as far as you can see, there's no in the, there, there's no, you know, nothing stopping you from looking uh for a long, long way. So when I think about these works and because also my, you know, my black and white films have all been in a fairly sparse um, studio space. And, but all, I've always been thinking that they would, they're, they're in, in infinity when I'm shooting them. Yeah. And I think that's particularly true with this work because you literally were there on set saying, you know, you're lassoing the infinity, you're lassoing the endless right now. And then that's, where it came to be that it had to be more than one lasso, right? It's this uh, sort of endless task almost, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I forgot I said that to him. Thank you. For, oh, of course. For being, for remembering that on set. Mm -hmm. So now we have the Indian iron workers, which again, so, it's so interesting. They're removed from their environment because they built the city, you said. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just didn't want them in a construction site. Mm -hmm. And not that I didn't appreciate the construction site, but the idea of having, um, you know, uh, these men in a studio space that's, quote, this site of glamour, right? You know, if we think, <laughs> you know, the, the site of glamour and just, you know, showing their beauty. Mm -hmm. I just, mm -hmm. I love the idea of, of having them come to, that we shoot in the studio. Mm -hmm. And they liked it as well. It was a lovely reciprocal uh, exchange that was going on. That's true. And, that's true. Yeah. And also thinking, okay, um, not, you know, the usual sets, props, and costumes. Mm -hmm. uh, when we invited them, it was like, you know, I wanted to photograph iron workers and wear whatever you like to wear. But I mm -hmm. wanted to photograph iron workers. So some came in with all their gear and others came in. Uh, with their civilian wear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so now we get into a headdress, headdresses. The headdresses. Mm -hmm. so there was five in that series. Which, um, so Janine was the first one out of that series. And then you created another four as well. And it's kind of funny because actually like most of them you create, you created them at the same time. They got released like a little bit at different times. So Janine came out first for the Vancouver Art Gallery show, survey show, Fringing the Cube. And then the five as a set um, first were shown together uh, in Toronto for the biennial. Yeah, like this. So that's at the biennial in Toronto. So there's the fire box and the wind box mm -hmm. that are part of uh, fringing the cube. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's going to come up soon. And so I was thinking about how, you know, when we have a working relationship with you mm -hmm. and um, how, you know, we're in the studio 
and it's and 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 the studio at UBC is the first time that I've had a you know bona fide studio that wasn't you know in the living room in the kitchen yeah or or rented space to take photographs so it's my first time having a studio where I can go and just you know mall and play and that kind of thing so but just riffing off each other when we were getting to the point of firebox and and windbox that was mm -hmm. as a result being in the studio riffing together and then when I was having my show at the VAG mm -hmm. and uh, you know we're thinking of titles for the show that's just that's a studio picture of is that yeah. the one with yeah so just I think it shows maybe there's 10 people in there but yeah, that just, was not about a full day <laughs> <laughs> so it just, and also I mean it could be me too it could be my process that I like to feed everybody. You know, my sister comes and cooks. It was great. I was I not hungry for 10 days. <laughs> her apron on. She loves to cook. And I mean, we just, you know, like to feed people. And, you know, mm. sometimes the first thing to do is after every, after the studio is set up, then to break and we eat together and then we start mm. to make. And so, um, Got it, got it, be nourished. I'd like to and, just very, very quickly go back to the firebox because uh, we don't have to go back in time, but um, specifically because A, there's, you know, you mentioned that your home is still Saskatchewan. And of course, when you've lived there and, and that expense will always impact you. But then you mentioned in our conversations before that you can't ignore the uh, influence that the Vancouver art scene has had on you. And so it's funny because when it actually came time to make the firebox, it, it, you were so worried about making it. You were like, oh no, but the guys, they already made it. The guys, the Vancouver guys, they made it. Should I make it? And I think it was Dana Algaitis, I believe, that... Or was it Kathleen that, no, that it was Dino Gaitis that, you know, talked with you and, and convinced you, no, no, you, you're allowed to make a box. <laughs> and so that's when it came to be the firebox. So it was just not just a light box. It was a firebox. Thanks for, for bringing that up. Is that, you know, I've been completely influenced by Vancouver mm -hmm. um, from just, you know, being a passive observer, uh, watching people make art and then eventually making my own art, but, you know, being certainly, certainly aware of, um, you know, the Vancouver school mm -hmm. and the role of the, of the light box. But I was relieved when I thought I can call mine fire boxes. And then I sort of had a relief from all of that history. And, exactly. and, and, you know, and there's been conversations around culturalizing it and those kind of things. So here's back at, in the studio where I yes. love to be. I love to be in the studio. I love to be in the Sundance circle and I love to be in the classroom. These are places that for me in terms of creativity and teaching and learning and spirit, there's, you know, so much of that is all within those, those three places. And so um, this is a, a great photo of uh, being in the studio. Mm -hmm. And I'm just looking at work with the team. Mm -hmm more people with the team that's a great studio that space oh henry i've worked with some great photographers as well mm -hmm. but yeah it's like a real production it's it is like the same as being on a movie set And I just feel like I'm your little shadow in the background. I'm just kind of following. I'm like, boop. <laughs> I know and then <laughs> my glorious oh, behind. <laughs> right. <laughs> As dressing Shade, it just takes lots of hands. So I liked this. I found this when I was looking through images. It was again, you know, having the privilege to have a studio space at UBC. You know, I recognize that. And uh, and then you know riffing with my studio assistant, mm -hmm. and I can't read them all. But will you read a few? I think it says fringing self. Let's get fringed. Dana Claxton fringed. Becoming fringe. I fringe. Fringing the image. Long sway the fringe. Oh, that's a, that was a good one. Long sway the fringe. I like it. Oh, long, oh, long sway the fringe. What you know, you like long live the fringe, but long sway the fringe instead. Right. Mm -hmm. And so fringing the gallery, fringing space, fringing the walls. Yeah. And then Pauline jumps up 
out of her assist, <laughs> studio assistant <laughs> chair and screams out. What did you scream out, Pauline? Fringing the cube. <laughs> it was such a be beautiful moment. We're like, yes, fringing the cube. That's what I'm doing here. I'm fringing the cube. So these are some installation shots at the VEG, and I'll just quickly uh, wrap this up. But also, also have the at the invitation of the Vancouver Art Gallery to curate other works within my exhibition, and that was such a uh, uh, an amazing gift and opportunity to go through their collection and to select these works that um, that I thought were that you know you can create conversations. Maybe we didn't create them at the same time to have a dialogue, but we were you know to create to create new conversations. And then we hung some of the banners. And then this was lovely working with uh, the exhibition space that was already there and thinking about the face, thinking about the face and the head uh, was that section. I apologize for my cat. Oh, I can't see him. That's okay, he's off the side. <laughs> so anything, thank you, Pauline. I'm back. Hi. 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 That was oh, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> there have been no questions in the chat, so I just let you keep chatting. Oh, thank you. So. But we're now approaching a couple minutes before the scheduled end. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, Dan, are there more slides that we... No, there? I think that's the last one. I think that's the last one. But I see your cat now. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's like... <laughs> You know, when the cat comes, you just can't push him off. He'll come back. <laughs> um, you know, I think we had also hoped to, to just touch upon when in Dana's career I came. Um, and it was at a very, very dynamic time uh, in, in her career, in your career, Dana, because, you know, you had been at UBC for about four years and you were starting to make these, like, magnitudes bigger pieces you know the firebox and 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 then you know you had just started to do the billboards across canada and that was at a time where you had to be so flexible and just wear so many hats to actually see that production come to fruition that it allowed our relationship to be very dynamic as well and so i think that's why it sort of like evolved so organically to you know what i feel like having a hand in everything <laughs> But correct me if I'm wrong. No, I mean it was it was it was a, a pivotal moment and uh, for for me for to to create works and also to um, you know have the studio, but also to have somebody supporting those those things that go on in and outside of the studio. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's terrible, not terrible, but it's the reality of, you know, some of the sort of administrative business aspects of being an artist that, you know, you have to wear all of these hats. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, studio managers can handle, you know, t t take on some of those administrative duties. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, as well as, you know, you're you're an artist and you're creative and you have your own practice, right? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, being able to create with a, another artist as opposed to, you know, somebody with an MBA or something and not dissing them, you know, it, it, it's, it, it makes, um, I think, a relationship between an artist and their studio assistant, studio manager, when they're an artist and, and are engaged in the creative process. And, you know, you're a political thinker, you're a spiritual being. And um, so it's, and you have this, you know, enormous sense of humor. It just, you know, it, make, it, it makes the job of an artist uh, that much more pleasant. Well, thank you. I think I'm the very, very lucky one. I guess we both are. Yes, this is love all around. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, thank you so much, both Dana and Pauline. I mean, it's been wonderful to hear not just about Dana, the incredible work that you've made over many, many years, but the relationship that you have with your assistant studio manager, former student, um, and the, how the, those relationships kind of help to, to build the work and to build, um, you know, build the career that you have been so, I think, honored for and um, 
I think the Governor General's Award is just one of those small kind of recognitions that I think you deserve as one of our most interesting, important Canadian artists. So thank you very much for sharing this with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Yes. Now, for those of you who don't know, we're doing a series with our Governor General Award winning artists, all of whom are super fantastic and uh, contributing their time to these conversations. So uh, next Monday, we have a conversation with Anna Torma uh, in conversation with Shauna Thompson, who is a curator at the Isker Foundation in Calgary. Uh, we'll be doing that next Monday at 1 p.m. And I want to thank everybody for being here today and also acknowledge the Canada Council for the Arts for their support of the Governor General's Awards uh, and the exhibition here at the Art Gallery of Alberta. So thank you again, everybody, and I hope to see you next Monday. Thank you. It can also, you can also look at the exhibition online through an online video walkthrough at the AGA website if someone wants to actually see the show itself. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>